with the with the Carter Presidential Center. Today there's a lecture flying in the new Cuba. It's about to start. Lord's Affairs Council. Hey Jazz, what's going on, man? Cuba. Carter Presidential Center. We're in Atlanta, Georgia with Dr. Russo Trevino. We have a lecture tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about some issues facing Cuba. Here's our speakers. There we go. I'm a professor at University of California, San Diego. And it's going to be Ambassador Shapiro. Who was president of the World Affairs Council in Atlanta, Georgia? They have a meet and greet beforehand. They have a welcome, and then you have the expert, and then they have a discussion. And that is Friday. There's going to be another section too. Thursday, July 16th. So we're about to start. So enjoy. Follow me here on ABC Vision. Okay, we're about to start. Enjoy. decades and now I'm very very honored and pleased to be back here with the Americas program and to be able to share the, a program that we have going on for the next day with the I'm going to steal your thunder okay. here this is with the friends of the Inter-American Democratic Charter which is a group that President Carter founded in 2004 of former heads of state, former vice presidents, former cabinet ministers, leaders of human rights in the hemisphere to support the Organization of American States. We have a, a meeting tomorrow, a closed door meeting with the group of these leaders, some of whom are here tonight, which Charles will introduce. And we also are honored to have the, the new Secretary General of the OAS coming here to the Carter Center tomorrow as well. So we were, we were able to leverage these visitors with the World Affairs Council to have this program and also the program on Thursday afternoon with Joaquin Villalobos. I'm sure you'll mention that as well. But tonight, uh, I am very honored to, to share this program with Ambassador Shapiro and Dr. Ricky Feinberg who both have extensive experience going in and out of Cuba, which is what you're here to hear about. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to Ambassador Shapiro. and know that you're going to have a very interesting presentation here tonight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charles Shapiro, and I'm the President of World Affairs Council. Everybody told me you cannot do a program in Atlanta in July. 
lie because nobody will show up. <laughs> it looks to me like y'all are here. So I'm, I'm delighted to have you here tonight. I, I just asked him on the other hand to please put your phone on vibrate right now while I introduce these to people. Uh, this is, as Jenny was saying, this is a joint program of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta and the Carter Center America's program, which Jenny is the director of. And so what we've done, they've got this big program all day tomorrow, and we snagged some of Jenny's speakers and participants, Richard Feinberg, for tonight, and then on Thursday afternoon at one o'clock, Joaquin Villalobos, who was the leader of the FMLN in El Salvador and helped negotiate the peace accord, signed it, the peace accord with the government, and now is a political analyst living in London. And so we're going to talk with him on Thursday, and he's going to get his view of the left in Latin America. And so I invite you all to come back then. We've got some distinguidos with us tonight. This is, I, I got to say, this is very cool for me. This, I've, I've been the President of World Affairs Council for almost a year now. Um, and this is the first program that I've done where we've got former presidents and former government ministers here. So I am delighted. And, and I'm not fooling myself. I know it's the Carter Center who got him here. Um, <laughs> but former president of Panama, Nicolas Ardito Barleta is here. Uh, the former foreign minister of Chile, Alejandro Foxley, is here. Uh, the former minister of labor of Paraguay, Avente, is here. I'm delighted to have you all. My dear friend and former foreign service colleague, Peter DeShazo. Peter, raise your hand. Yeah. Okay, Peter DeShazo is here. And now this, now we move from the formers to the presidents. Uh, my board members are very important. And Atlanta City Councilman Kwanzaa Hall is here. And Kwanzaa, actually, we're in his district, the second district. So if you have any complaints about bottle, <laughs> garbage pickup, the swimming pools, he'll be glad to talk to you later. Kwanzaa, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Kwanzaa went with the World Affairs Council on the trip we took with Mayor Kasim Reed to Havana the last week of June. And also on that trip were, and, and wave your hand when I call your name, Dan Easton, uh, Sylvia and Jorge Fernandez, who are, who are here. Uh, Jorge is also the Vice President of the Metro Atlanta Chamber for, Inter for Global Commerce, is that it? Uh, Carol Orndorff is here, and Claire Higgins-Morton in the first row. And John Spillman went with us to Cuba in April. Where are you, John? John is there. Um, and so I'm very delighted to have y'all here. Now, we're here to listen to Richard Feinberg. Richard Feinberg is a, a dear friend and former colleague, both from Washington, where we both worked in the, well, we actually both worked in the Carter administration as well, did we not? Me at the very bottom, I was the, the most junior guy in the Carter administration. Richard was very senior. Um, and then Richard in the in Clinton administration, I was a career guy, and so our paths crossed again. And then we were colleagues at University of California, San Diego, where Richard teaches at uh, the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, the premier graduate school in international relations some would say on the West Coast, some would say in the country. Is that, is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm supposed to say that. Um, and Richard, for the purposes of tonight's conversation, is also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, Institute, it's not institution, institute, institution, institution in Washington, where his work is on Cuba. And I think this is true, and I'm going to assert it as true, uh, and don't disagree with me, is that Richard knows more about the private sector in Cuba, the Cuenta Propistas, than anybody outside of Cuba. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very good. The, the last time Richard and I 
spoke about Cuba, he packed the audience with his class. And he gave extra points <laughs> if they applauded him. <laughs> so, I, and not just at the end, but throughout the course of the I'm evening. Away all my every time he said something in there, it was a round of applause. I welcome you all to do the same. Because okay. Richard's now going to talk for a few minutes about Cuba and the private sector in Cuba, the self-employed, and then we're going to have a discussion. So, Richard, over to you. Now, this is where you applaud. <laughs> Charles, I appreciated that. Uh, first, I just have to say, being here at the Carter Center, uh, it's, it is an honor for me, and it's rather special, because uh, my first important job in the U.S. government was uh, on the policy planning staff of the State Department back in 1977. Um, if you can, some of you can go back to that time when you might recall during Jimmy Carter's uh, presidential campaign, uh, on, he made foreign policy a centerpiece of that campaign, and the centerpiece of that campaign was human rights. The argument being that the United States, although the world is complex and you can't change all the world to fit your image, nevertheless, human rights being a, a, a core value of the United States, that uh, value had to be reflected, it had to be an important piece of American foreign policy. And he very specifically was criticizing uh, the previous administration, most notably Henry Kissinger, for having uh, con been contemptuous, overtly contemptuous, of the whole idea of human rights having anything to do with foreign policy. And uh, that had actually more or less been the policy of the uh, US government, particularly the State Department, during the Cold War, uh, which you know was what, 20 plus years by then. So this idea that human rights really shouldn't be taken very seriously was pretty deeply embedded. So in order to shake up a government, it's a very hard thing to do. Uh, a, a president only gets to appoint really a handful of people at the top. Uh, and uh, you know, the way social networks work, work in Washington, uh, most people are hesitant to rock the boat too much. In order to really shake things up, you have to bring in, this is what President Carter did, he brought in very young people. Uh, so he brought in three or four of us in key positions, one Robert Pastor, who worked here for many years uh, at the White House, and myself at the State Department, a few others of us. Um, and we were all so young. Uh, I look back now and think, oh my god, it was so irresponsible to president <laughs> to appoint such young people. Uh, but if you want to really shake things up, uh, that's one way to do it. Because we were fearless. We were so young, we weren't worried about our careers. Uh, or how other, what other people might think. We were really very mission-driven and issue-driven. And uh, we did, in fact, turn around, I think, American foreign policy, certainly in the Western Hemisphere and to some degree elsewhere. Uh, there have been some ups and downs over the years, but I would say largely, I would argue, largely President Carter and, and, and us helping him out uh, were successful in putting human rights uh, at the center. Obviously, there are other issues that have to be balanced but at, uh, as a very core value in American foreign policy. So I'm very pleased to have been given the opportunity to participate in that very young team uh, under the leadership of President Carter. Uh, so fast forward now to, uh, to Cuba. <clears throat> so I was lucky enough uh, to be in Cuba on December 17th. I happened to be attending a, a meeting sponsored by the foreign ministry there. Uh, so most of the people at the meeting, uh, there were about 10 Americans, the rest were Cuban diplomats or, or aspiring diplomats at the uh, school there for, for uh, young diplomats. And suddenly we're told, this is in the morning, there's going to be an important announcement, an important announcement. So everybody's herded into this a big auditorium, maybe 200 people, big screen. And we knew that we had some idea. We thought really it was probably going to be the announcement of a, a spy swap. Uh, and so Raul, of course, being in Cuba, but, but uh, the two presidents were speaking simultaneously, Raul in Havana, of course, uh, President Obama in Washington. Being in Cuba, naturally, they start off with the president of Cuba. And first he announces the spy swap, which was everybody applauded. This was wonderful because people in Cuba knew who these uh, spies were who were being held in the United States for over a decade. And that was a big accomplishment for Raul. 
But then he goes on to say, and, and, President Obama and I, a man for whom I have much respect, which right away was a quote, using the uh, Cuban leaders don't say that about American presidents. I have much respect, uh, and, and, we have agreed to normalize diplomatic relations. And I can tell you when that was said by Raul Castro, and Raul Castro was there, uh, he was just sitting down uh, in his military uniform, uh, no backdrop uh, other than a, a simple picture of Jose Marti, you know, from George Washington, let's say, of Cuba. And he was actually reading the speech on a piece of paper. Who reads speeches these days on pieces of paper, right? Heads of state, you expect teleprompters and such. But it was very effective because he had his military uniform on, and the fact that he was reading it signified that this was an official statement. He was not ad libbing. This was the policy of Cuba. And he was announcing this with, uh, with his epaulets. That is to say, this is the regime speaking, this is Raul Castro speaking. So that was a message that everybody understood in the audience. People were so moved. You could hear them as soon as he announced the normalization of relations. <gasps> this huge gasp. People were, could it possibly be? And then I can tell you, people stood up and they started applauding and embracing each other and even crying. And then all of a sudden, everyone breaks spontaneously into singing the Cuban national anthem. That's how emotional and dramatic that moment was. Because people in Cuba suddenly could feel, I think, that this 50-year nightmare of endless hostilities with their very large neighbor, finally, uh, that nightmare looked like it was coming to an end and there would be a brighter future ahead. That's why it was such an emotional moment for the Cubans. Then I also had the opportunity to attend the Summit of the Americas in Panama uh, in early April. And this again was another uh, very big moment. Uh, the Cubans had not attended the Summit of the Americas uh, ever, uh, but the Latin Americans insisted. They said, we will not attend any more summits with the United States unless Cuba is invited. That was an ultimatum, in effect, that the Latin Americans presented to the US. And uh, because the US valued the summits, the U.S. said, okay, uh, and that was also the opportunity for the U.S. government to rethink Cuban policy and to reframe it completely. We can talk more about that maybe in the Q&A. Uh, but so, it did, so Raul is there, he's sitting only four seats away on the podium from uh, President Obama. And Raul begins his remarks by saying, well, this is the seventh summit, we are given eight minutes each to speak. But since I haven't been at the previous <laughs> six, <laughs> and he then, so he showed a little sense of humor, that's a good thing. Uh, but then he started to spend about the next 30 minutes giving his version of uh, world events, you know, the sweep of Marxist history, uh, American imperialism, etc. And I began to think, and I'm sure other people began to think, oh no, this is really going the wrong way. I can't believe he's going to do this. But, but I was waiting. I figured, well, he has to say this for back home, you know, because he's got to explain to his cadres what is he doing there and why is he about to start engaging with the United States. So, so he got that over with, and then he turned to President Obama, who was just four seats away. And he said, and Mr. President, uh, I have read your memoirs. Okay, not every word, <laughs> uh, Castro says, but I've read your memoirs. And I have concluded, and also watching your behavior over the last six years, I have concluded that you are an honest and trustworthy man, and a man who has been true to his humble origins. And coming from a Cuban, a socialist Cuban, saying that somebody is loyal to their humble origins is high praise indeed. So here was, he was opening the way to a new relationship uh, with the leadership uh, of the United States. Uh, and the rest is history. Uh, next week in Havana and in Washington, the, uh, the, the uh, ministers of foreign affairs of both countries will raise their respective flags over their intersections, transforming them into full-fledged embassies. So that's where things are today diplomatically. Uh, a new beginning, a new opening in inter-American, in US-Cuban relations, and I would say in inter-American relations. The impact has been very important. 
Uh, why was it that the meeting with Dilma Rousseff, president of Brazil, was so successful very recently, when only three years ago she had refused to even come to Washington? There are a number of reasons having to do with internal Brazilian politics, etc. But the improvement in U.S. Cuban relations creates an atmosphere in which every leader slightly on the left in Latin America now wants to be seen in the good graces of the United States. Because if Raul Castro can say that President of America is an honest man, how can they not also say the same thing? Even the President of Venezuela, who has had very rocky relations with the United States, is now beginning to show some signs of, gee, if Raul can have good relations, uh, I look like I'm in left field. I need to think about repairing my relations with the U.S. as well. So it's not only U.S. Cuban relations is affected by this, but it reverberates really uh, around the Western, the Western Hemisphere. I've been told by the White House that even the president of, of Bolivia, uh, Evo Morales, who has decided to make a career out of bashing the U.S., has requested uh, a meeting with the president. Uh, not likely to happen, uh, but that tells you uh, the importance of this shift in inter-American relations. So, just a little briefly, I'll go briefly into what's going on on the island and what might go forward, and then we can engage in our exchange. All right, first of all, uh, there is an emerging private sector, maybe uh, 500,000 people, 10% uh, of the labor force of 5 million are now working in small-scale enterprise. Maybe we'll hear, maybe hear a bit about that from, I know some Cubans here in the audience have some direct experience with that. Uh, so a lot of these people are making money. Uh, it is exciting, there's new opportunities, uh, but it is limited. Many other Cubans, however, uh, have some, most of whom, of course, work for the state. It's a socialist state, no make, no, make no mistake. But lots of people have jobs on the side because the wages that you make as a public sector employee are insufficient, insufficient to just uh, make ends meet. Uh, so lots of people work on the side, maybe their own jobs. So if you're a doctor during the day in the state uh, hospital, you might work in the evenings or on the weekends, in effect, as a private doctor uh, being paid for your services. Uh, or you might do something completely different. Uh, you might uh, have a job as a teacher and uh, bake uh, cakes uh, on the weekends for social events. So uh, there's a lot of people with already one foot uh, in the private sector, so that's happening. So there's a certain dynamism there. And one of the things that the United States is trying to do is fortify that private sector, and I'll explain that in a bit. There's also an incipient growth of a co-op movement uh, some, a, a lot of restaurants, uh, uh, beauty salons are, that were formerly owned by the state and run by the state, like everything else in Cuba, are now being handed over to the current workers and they're, and they're being told, okay guys, you don't have a co-op, try to make the best of it. Uh, also Cuba, um, importantly, Cubans did, used to not be allowed to travel without a special permit. You couldn't leave the island without a special permit. That's been changed. Uh, you still need to be able to pay for the air ticket, as you would in any country, and you still need to be able to get a visa to go into another country, uh, which is not always the easy. That's also a common problem worldwide. So, that there, so the atmosphere in general, uh, I would say, there's a certain sense of dynamism and a certain sense of political relaxation, relatively speaking. But make no mistake, it's still largely a, a state-owned enterprise economy. Uh, it's still a one-party state. Uh, you cannot get to decide you want to run it. The, the council Madeira did not just decide, oh, we'd like to form a new party and see how, you know, see if you might see successful running for office. Definitely not. Uh, that's certainly not allowed. What is the United States trying to do? And this will be my last point before we open it up, okay? Um, traditionally, the U.S. position was we can't move ahead uh, until, we have a, until we know that the Cubans are going to respond positively. But we want to negotiate a deal. We'll do something if you do something. And what did we find over 50 years of that tactic? That that put U.S. foreign policy in the hands of Fidel Castro. He was in the driver's seat because he could decide what he wanted to do and therefore what the United States could do. So long as we conditioned our policy on Fidel Castro's behavior. 50 years of trying that. We never got off the dime. Uh, this administration decided we're going to do it differently. We're just going to take unilateral measures. We're not negotiating. So they negotiated just a spy swap. But all the rest of U.S. policy was not negotiated and was unilateral. U.S. said, okay, we are, uh, other than the establishment of the embassies. Yeah, that was negotiated. The 
U.S. said, American telecom companies and firms, hardware, software, can work with the Cuban uh, state-owned telecom company uh, that's okay with us. Uh, if U.S. firms want to buy and sell with this emerging private sector in Cuba, that also will be licensed and allowed. So a number of steps also made it, we made it easier for tourists to travel there. Uh, uh, there are still some regulations, but it's a lot easier. There's a big surge in tourism. We've also made it easier for people to send money uh, for philanthropic purposes or to support their friends and families uh, on the island. We also said you can bring back not only uh, arts and crafts and uh, cultural items, which was true in the past, but there's now a $100 sin quota. That is to say, you can bring back up to $100 of cigars and rum. <laughs> <laughs> From a purely trade point of view, cigars, you know, tobacco, and, uh, and alcohol are not in the same category, right? right? We figured out they have 100 bucks worth of sin, but not more. Right? So that's sort of where things stand now. However, up to now, Cuba has not taken advantage of these offers on the table. Uh, it's still very difficult to buy and sell goods uh, to that emerging private sector. Uh, channels have not been established. If you want to fill your suitcases uh, with stuff and fly you know, through Miami or whatever, that you can do. But in a more sort of commercial vein, uh, those channels do not yet exist. Uh, there have been telecommunications talks, uh, but so far no deals uh, have been struck in that area. Uh, the other thing that's happening on the island is with regard to foreign investment. Now, U.S. firms, again, this needs to be, I know there's a lot of confusion out here. When people hear the word normalization, they assume, oh, the embargo must be over, right? But it was the normalization of diplomatic relations, not normalization of economic relations. So it's still illegal for US citizens or corporations to invest in Cuba. If you want to give a friend a donation to open up a restaurant, you can do that. Uh, undoubtedly, there's some Cuban Americans who have an understanding with their friends there that maybe they would like to get uh, some profit back, but that has to be an informal understanding to be in accordance with US law. That you, you could not have a formal contract and invest. That would be illegal. Um, but the rest of the world can invest in Cuba. And the Cubans have said, we want foreign investment. And they had they passed a new foreign investment law two years ago, agreed pretty well, like with any other country. How many new investments have been approved, however? Very few. Uh, we hear there are big, big press reports that make maybe three or four modest size investments. And, we, and I, I've seen this so often in Cuba, announcements are made, nothing happens. So until I actually see a groundbreaking, I'm not sure that those investments will actually come to fruition. So what's the problem here? Why haven't they responded to the offer on the table of the United States? Why haven't they been able to approve, to approve more foreign investment coming in? The, the trade minister travels around the world saying, we need foreign investment, we know we need technology, we know we need access to markets, we know we need more capital. <coughs> We're desperate for all of those things. Why aren't these projects approved? What's the problem? Why aren't things moving ahead? And the answer to that will come out of our bilateral dialogue. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, <laughs> Richard, thank you. I, I will say that your class actually applauded louder. <laughs> You've got to put on your little microphone there. And then, can, can you hear me? Is this working? Yeah. yeah, good. So you can hear me. And Richard, so I've, I've got some questions for you. Um, first of all, is it true you know more about? The private sector of Cuba than anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, yes. So here's, here's a question. And, and this is more of a, a, a almost a vocabulary question. In, in Cuba, the people opening these businesses are called cuenta propistas. That is, that they're working on their own account. They're, they're not called empresarios, entrepreneurs. Why is that? What, what's the distinction? Is that a political thing, or is that just Cuban Spanish, or what, what's going on with that? Why are what you and I would recognize as entrepreneurs allowed to call themselves entrepreneurs, business yeah. people? Oh, good, good question, very good question. So first of all, these questions... But if you put on your tie, 
they'll hear you even when you turn your head around. It's open on the top. Yeah. Put, put it right underneath the knot. Otherwise, when you look at this way, way up the top. Very good. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Quentin Propistas uh, are allowed to employ people. So they're not, so, so you're self-employed, uh, might keep, make you think that they're just on their own. Uh, they can employ workers, uh, and some of them do. Um, uh, some of them also work on their own. Uh, but some Quentin Propistas, like if you own a restaurant, for example, uh, of course you have a staff. Uh, uh, if you are running a small-scale construction company, you, know, you may employ uh, a number of workers. And so some of these firms are getting larger, and uh, a, uh, an issue will be, uh, will they allow them to get bigger and bigger and bigger? Uh, some of the construction firms, for example, uh, are, are, getting, are, are becoming significant, and people are accumulating capital. Some of the restaurants, uh, you only have allowed to have up to 50 chairs in a restaurant, uh, some of them seem, you know, if you, if you count them, if you have the bar, which might be counted separately, uh, and then you hear stories of people opening up a second restaurant or a bar or whatever. So there are people who are making significant amounts of money uh, by Cuban uh, standards. Uh, and I think the regime is nervous about that. They would say they're nervous about it because they don't like inequality. And that gets to this issue of, uh, but they're also nervous about what they would call uh, the emergence of a capitalist class, or if you want to be derogatory about it, a petty bourgeois uh, strata. Uh, and that's why the word entrepreneur isn't used. Uh, entrepreneur sounds like a positive term, you might think. Uh, but in their, from their point of view, individual initiative is not an official you know, so, so, uh, socialist ideology. They want collective efforts, efforts on behalf of the group, on behalf of the firm, the community, the nation as opposed to on behalf of the individual. Uh, so that's still a, a tension uh, in their, uh, so they're in, a, they're in a period of sort of transition moving from this collectivist concept uh, to a concept which is more mixed. They still have a collectivist, but they are allowing space for individual enterprise. When we were in Havana in last month, um, we learned that there are 201 permissible categories that private people can enter in. Uh, restaurants, cell phone repair, uh, barbers, beauty parlors, I mean, very, mostly in services. Yes. Um, but I'd be willing to bet you that in a mile radius of where we're sitting right now, there's probably 5,000 different categories of jobs taking place. I mean, why is it so severely limited, and are, and are they going to expand that? Yeah, so 211, because this, this, this is their idea of uh, how you go about doing things. Everything is lots of rules and regulations governing all types of activities. Uh, so this is what, what you would call a, uh, a positive list and rather a negative list. If we were to do something like this in our country, we might have a list of things you cannot do, that would be a negative list, but you can do anything else. They're doing the reverse. It's, these are the things that are allowed, anything not on that list, you cannot do. Okay, so it's much more of a restrictive approach, and you can't be creative and invent new things that aren't on that list. What are particularly not on that list are middle class professional activities. So if you want to be a lawyer, uh, or an engineer, or an architect in Cuba, you have to work for state-owned enterprise or now maybe possibly a cooperative. You can't just set up your own office and say, hey, any clients, you know, I'm open for business. You, cannot, you can still not do that. So this is, this is frustrating uh, for the middle classes, who, uh, the educated middle classes uh, who are large in Cuba. And this is something I want to emphasize, by the way. If you have this idea that Cuba has made you know, a lot of workers and peasants, uh, that's not the case. There is a, a large middle class. If by middle class you mean uh, someone who's got at least high school education, uh, if you mean someone who lives in a family, uh, a nuclear family of, of modest size, with fam uh, where wo the woman often works, where you have um, a home ownership, uh, where you have access to Social Security, uh, so the various definitions of middle class, uh, that it's, it's a large middle class, except with regard to one uh, cat uh, category, and that is consumption goods. 
what we in the United States would, would associate with middle class consumption patterns, that would be rare in Cuba. They just don't have access to all the goodies that we uh, you know, clog our homes with, that, uh, that they don't have. But otherwise, they are middle class uh, in many respects. Yeah. And those people are frustrated because they cannot exercise their profession outside of the state sector, which is why many of them leave. Uh, and so you have, unfortunately, this very significant brain drain uh, of the younger, more talented folks uh, leaving Cuba. Uh, if you would ask why is the government going to think about reform, uh, which has, uh, from their point of view, uh, dangerous political implications, uh, I think part of the answer is they see their children and grandchildren uh, leaving, and that has to be upsetting to them. Um. So on December 17th, the president said that you and I, the people in this room, can sell and buy from the Cuban private sector. He said that U.S. Uh, computer and telecommunications firms can sell to the state telecommunications company. Is anything going to come of that? I mean, can, can you sell now to the lady that's got a restaurant? So, uh, well, first on the U.S. side, uh, there is some hesitancy to uh, engage in some of these activities. If you speak to the lawyers of some of the companies, they say, well, you know, the regs aren't clear enough, and uh, there's an issue of financing, and they finance the goods, and can banks support these transactions? So um, I've been talking to people in the U.S. government trying to get them to issue clarifying regulations. So I think that would help on the U.S. side. On the Cuban side, though, um, I've also been suggesting that uh, we should try to put a little, we should up the pressure a little bit, which is to say, we should be, we, the US government, the now the embassy, should be regularly pointing out, uh, hey, this offer's on the table, wouldn't this be good for the Cuban people? Wouldn't this be a, an injection of economic uh, dynamism? And why is the government standing in the way? Now, why is the government standing in the way? Well, here, you know, the Cuban government, it's not like uh, the Minister of Finance or, or uh, the President or, you know, has regular press conferences to discuss these things with the people. They don't do that. There's no media interaction. These people are in no way accessible. So in order to try to, fig to figure out why the government does or doesn't do something is left to conjecture. And you could only think, well, it could be inertia. They've done something the same way, more or less, for 50 years. And to do things differently, uh, you know, is a shock and it's difficult. And, so just, just inertia is one, one probable answer. Second answer is decision-making process. You know, back in the old days, a few years ago, uh, all decisions were made by one very charismatic, very uh, strong personality, Fidel Castro. Uh, now that he's not at the helm, uh, who gets to make decisions? And it's not clear to people. Uh, Raul doesn't have the same uh, dominating personality, uh, but who does then have the right to, the authority to make decisions? And there seems to be a lot of uncertainty about that. Uh, then there's the ideological factor. Uh, at least some people, I mean, there's still a, what, what is called sometimes a left opposition. They say people who think we're going to stick with socialism. In fact, we'd even like it to be more socialist than it is. Uh, and so there's a constant opposition there. Uh, it probably has some protection at senior levels. Uh, so these, fa these, these various factors of inertia, uncertainty about authority, and ideological um, pushback uh, may explain the, the lack of reaction so far. In, in so your answer is no. <laughs> uh, so far. Yeah. I, I always remain hopeful that, you know, it's only six months, uh, which may seem like a lot to us, but given this regime has been in power for 50 years, uh, you know, I think things, things reasonably take some time. Obama, by the way, was very clear about this. Uh, he, whenever he talks about Cuba, he's always very clear to say, look, we are not expecting uh, this to turn around on a dime. Uh, this will be a gradual process. Uh, we're not even sure if it will work, he sometimes says in a professorial way. L leaders rarely say things like that. It's fascinating to listen to Obama articulate uh, you know, more profound thoughts than you often uh, hear at the political level. He said, you know, we're trying this out. There's no guarantees. Let's see what happens. We know it doesn't work. We know pounding them over the head for 50 years, that has not produced anything. Let's try this different approach of engagement, and let's see what happens. The, the people who went on both trips to, to Cuba with the World Affairs Council and in the meetings we had just kept wondering, I mean, why won't the 
government, the regime, unleashed the private sector. I mean, the, 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 the economy is inflexible and doesn't work. Uh, the state controls 95% of the Cuban economy. And the, it would just seem that it would be so easy um, to let the dynamism of these people or, who are starting businesses and being super inventive um, create jobs, create work, create wealth. I mean, why won't they do that? Will the government, are, are they tolerated or are they encouraged? So uh, initially, uh, back in the 90s, when Fidel allowed a little bit of private sector activity, that, I would say, was tolerated. He didn't really like it, but he allowed it because they needed some jobs and some uh, consumer goods to be created. But then he sort of he, he halted that once he felt he didn't need it anymore. So with him, it was tolerated. Uh, Raul has said, on more than one occasion, that this uh, emerging private sector is a good thing. It's to be encouraged. I mean, he has said that, so he's moved from tolerating to encouraging, at least uh, in his official rhetoric. Uh, Can it be rolled back? But he does at the same time say um, he doesn't want to see uh, a, a new bourgeoisie emerge. So there's a, there's a certain tension here. And yes, they would like to see some job creation, some more consumer goods and better services, but they don't want to see, they being the Communist Party, they don't want to see uh, a political challenge emerged from a, a capitalist class. And so they're, they're concerned that uh, small-scale enterprise eventually becomes medium-scale enterprise, which is and some of the medium-scale enterprise becomes big enterprise. And then, then you have independent power from the state. And that's a challenge, politically. But also economically, you think, what does the average uh, middle-class Cuban do? Goes to his office, or her office, and uh, works in a ministry or a state-owned enterprise and issues directives. You know, do this, do that, or invest this, or set this price, whatever. Well, if suddenly you have a more market economy, a bigger private sector, uh, like what are these guys going to do? I mean, they'll be less, at minimum, they'll be less powerful. Maybe they'll even be out of a job. So just in terms of the nitty-gritty of the daily person's life, I think there is a strata, probably, of, of mid-level uh, functionaries nomenclatura, as it's sometimes said in Eastern Europe, uh, who uh, see their own sort of personal positions <laughs> as potentially challenged. Uh, it's again, can it, is it reversible? Can the next president, or can Raul, if he wakes up tomorrow and decides this wasn't such a great idea, can, well, they, can, they, can they turn it back? Uh, I would say uh, it's unlikely. Um, they do certainly totally control the, the uh, security apparatus. Uh, I think nobody questions that. Uh, I'll just give you one example of how extensive it is. Um, so I happened to be in, in Havana uh, when the previous pope visited uh, Benedict in 2012. And you know, the, Pope Francis is going to be in Cuba on his way to the United States at the end of June. And uh, give, given the pope's... Uh, oh, in September. September, sorry, September, yes. September 18th. Uh, yes, in, oh, mid-September, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, given the pope's electric uh, performance in the Andean region, uh, let's see what happens in Cuba, where he'll be very much, I mean, his, his social rhetoric is very much aligned with the rhetoric of the Cuban regime. So he will be very well received in that regard. Uh, but it'll be fascinating to see just exactly how he, uh, how he positions himself there. But I think, I'm sure the Cubans will be very excited to receive him. Uh, they were less excited about Benedict, although you know, he was greeted respectfully. But I, I, I was in the plaza of the Revolution, the Revolution, the Revolutionary Plaza, which, you know, has the potential of holding a million people. And, and in Fidel's glory days, he would fill that plaza and give these famous uh, harangues. Uh, anyway, suddenly the, the Pope's there, and the Raul is up on the podium and all. And suddenly, 15 feet from me, a guy stands up, a single guy, and he unfurls a banner. And he starts chanting anti government slogans. <coughs> and before I could get my camera out, Suddenly, out of nowhere, 10 plainclothesmen appeared out of, out of the crowd. And they had him totally wrapped up uh, you know, with uh, tape around his mouth. And he was gone. He was gone before I could get my camera out. OK, so that gives you a sense of the omnipresence and the power still of the security forces. So 
if you say, uh, I think it, it would be a mistake to say it's impossible to do, for this to be reversed because they do have the command of the security force. But I think it's unlikely. I think it's very unlikely. Um, the regime would look as though there was no hope, as though there was no future. And I, 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 that, I don't sense that that, so I think controlling it, allowing it to move slowly uh, is more likely, uh, uh, a sense of stagnation is more likely than, than a reversal. That'd be, that'd be my best guess. The anecdote you just told me is a great segue to this question. The Carter Center received a letter from a gentleman named Omar Lopez and he adds the following, he sent it yesterday, and he says, uh, I respectfully ask that human rights be part of Tuesday night's conversation. The opening between the United States and Cuba has not improved the plight of the Cuban people. Um, you worked on human rights in the Carter administration, you, you just told us. How, how do you square your concerns and certainly the, the, the Obama administration's concern about human rights with dealing and normalizing diplomatic relations with a regime that does not respect human rights. Thank you for that question. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and thank Mr. Lopez. Lopez, and yeah. Mr. Lopez as well. Uh, so I, I would say a number of things about that. Uh, first, if, uh, if we're talking about the welfare of the Cuban people, then I think uh, we ought to engage economically, making, uh, allowing more tourism, allowing more remittances, uh, without a doubt is improving the living standards of many Cubans. And the numbers around the table, growth this year is to be better than about 4%, according to the government. And there's no doubt people who are visiting Havana recently see a visible influx of tourists, prices are rising, restaurants are full, uh, money is being made, uh, more goods are circulating. So in terms of just the the uh, economic impact, the humanitarian impact, it's already there and visible. Uh, in terms of uh, human political rights, if you're talking about that, um, the, um, by establishing embassies, uh, part of the agreement is it used to be with, under the old intersection that American diplomats could not travel outside of Havana without special permission from the government, which was often not granted. So now- And, and the reverse. And yes, well, there was this periodic reciprocity that used to go back and forth. Uh, so childish, but that, that's how it was. Uh, so anyway, um, but now we're in the new rules that we have negotiated, that, we, that the US pushed very hard for. Uh, some American diplomats will be allowed to travel around the island. They will also be allowed to engage with Cubans, both in the government uh, and uh, in civil society. Um, they seem like a small thing, but this does provide some cover for people that these people meet with, and it also provides the ability of the United States to gather more information, to have a better sense of what's going on, and, as necessary, to make representations to the Cuban government uh, to, to try to improve the situation. So uh, that sort of engagement is, uh, in a way, U.S. does diplomacy is a very well-known ambassador uh, on a worldwide basis. Obama is, uh, is not claiming that, again, overnight, uh, that, that um, Cuba is going to become sort of uh, a democratic paradise. Uh, what I think Obama would say is that, again, 50 years, we bashed them over the head. Uh, is Cuba, you know, what's the state of human rights in Cuba? Not fantastic, that, that guy's arguing. So, so what is he proposing? Uh, we tried bashing people over the head. If we tried a tit for tat, it was to say, unless you agree to all these human rights conditions, we're not moving forward, we wouldn't move forward. That we know. So, so hence the decision to take unilateral action on the part of the United States, uh, and we're playing the long game. Uh, the idea that an economic opening, uh, lots of American tourists, lots of engagement, uh, hopefully more private sector. Do you really think America. American tourists, I mean, if my next door neighbor or I go to Cuba, do you think that's gonna improve human rights in Cuba? I, I think it, it. I mean, I, I obviously more people will make more money because they'll be spending money. No, but no, but even though, the, because, uh, Cubans see an alternative, and they can talk to Americans and get more of a sense of you know, what life is like under a different political system. In that sense, yes, uh, I do think it matters. Also, by the way, we had some public opinion polls uh, that were done in Cuba. Obama is the most popular guy, 95% positive approval ratings of Barack Obama. And what's the margin of error? 
<laughs> three. So three, Charles. So it's 95, it's at least 92, okay? <laughs> uh, no, very, very popular guy. And Americans in general, those of you who travel in Cuba know that in general, Americans are well-liked in Cuba. Um, so you don't have, that, that's, that's one of the things that's, that's very hopeful, I would say, about uh, the situation in Cuba. Uh, Vis-a-vis -vis even the rest of the Caribbean, and also vis-a-vis -vis tourism. Uh, a problem with tourism is in the Caribbean is that on some of the islands, uh, you know, visitors often feel as, there's this ethnic or racial tension present, uh, or maybe some uh, uh, distaste for wealth or whatever. Uh, you don't feel any of those tensions in Cuba. So I think, uh, again, taking the longer view, I think it's important, when nobody's claiming all problems are going to be solved overnight, taking the longer view that uh, tourism, among other sectors, uh, has tremendous uh, potential uh, in Cuba. Okay, we're going to take questions from the audience after my last question to you. So be, please be thinking, and if there are any undergrads out here, we cannot go home until at least one undergrad student has asked a question, so get, get ready. Um, how faked out were you on December 17th? Did you think you would ever see this uh, in your working life, that the United States and Cuba would move to normalize diplomatic relations? Thank you for that question. And although I am not one to tout my own horn in public, since you asked, <laughs> um, just a few weeks earlier, I was quoted in the Financial Times as saying, I now think the stars are aligned in Havana and in Washington for there to be a major leap forward in U.S.-Cuban relations. Did you think that would be a resumption of diplomatic relations? And the very day before the announcement, when I was up participating on a panel, and there was a lot of skepticism uh, on both the Cuban and American uh, speakers, I was the one that, that asserted, again, that I, I could see, not that I knew, but that I could see, again, that, that I thought the stars were aligned, that one, that things were moving in Cuba, that I think they wanted a different relationship, to the extent that I could see that. Uh, and I did, uh, the Cuban diplomats, um, uh, uh, the ones who engage with the United States are extremely sophisticated, and they, you can watch their body language, and they communicate through their body language and phrases their attitudes. And I could see and, and hear and feel in talking to them that they really were looking to move forward. And then on the U.S. side, you have uh, a shift in the Cuban-American community, uh, towards a more, let's say, a progressive set of attitudes. Uh, importantly, the, the Democrats lost control of the Senate. That seems paradoxical. Why would that be good? Because the guy who was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and really was tying up all of American foreign policy uh, Bob Men around Cuba, Bob Menendez, Cuban-American family uh, from New Jersey, uh, he, as a Democrat, when the Democrats lost control of the Senate, he was out as chair. Uh, he all, since then, the Justice Department, in its wisdom, is tying him up with legal cases. Uh, uh, the way the Senate operates... Uh, you're, you're, you're not suggesting a connection. <laughs> we have a decentralized government, Charles. So I'm not suggesting that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so I, a number of factors in domestic American politics, uh, I also felt, and the summit, and this was, this was the last point, that was really... The Latin Americans put this ultimatum on the table, uh, summit with Raul or no summit, period. And so we had a big stake, therefore, in moving forward. And I wrote an article, uh, which I think had some influence, in which I said, look, guys, grab this. This is a wonderful opportunity to reframe all of Cuban-American uh, relations so that when Barack Obama and Raul Castro are together at the Summit of the Americas, rather than that being a confrontation and irritation, the entire audience will stand in applause. And that's exactly what happened, sir. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. I, I know there's a bunch of interns here tonight. Uh, raise, raise your hand if you're an undergrad somewhere. No. <laughs> raise your hand. Are there any undergrads? Yes. I'm an undergrad. Yeah, you're an overgrad. <laughs> Your, your, your former presidents get the first question, but before 
we do. Let me ask, we don't have a microphone for the audience. So I'm going to ask you to speak very loudly so everybody can hear you. Tell us who you are, if you'd be so kind. And I ask that the questions actually be questions. That is, in, in the question mark. So over, over to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, uh, when I listen to Richard, question, it reminded me when East Germany and West Germany got united. And West Germany had to invest over $20 billion to get the East Germans going because there was not any of the entrepreneurial spirit, notwithstanding that they were German, to really get it moving. Is that a similar situation that you see in Cuba? Uh, well, um, did everybody hear the question? <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, what's missing is the whole support structure that any private sector needs. So, uh, credit, there's no credit. The, the banks remain socialist banks. They don't lend to the, the private sector. Um, technical assistance uh, of the most basic sort, how to do accounting, uh, you know, managerial uh, structures. I mean, all of those things are missing, and all of those uh, support services are, are needed. Um, so uh, how to provide all of that? So uh, the church, the Catholic church, uh, has started some small-scale uh, education programs um, you know, to try to equip the entrepreneurs. Uh, the, uh, there's a, a regional development bank, the CAF, you know, I'm sure you know, uh, they are talking about setting up a micro a small microenterprise fund that would just begin this process. Uh, so your point is very well taken. All of that needs to be done. Uh, so far, uh, a number of international donors have offered, uh, the Spanish, uh, some, some Europeans, uh, some private Americans have offered to begin to provide these services. And again, so far, the Cuban government has remained very reticent, I think for all the reasons we've already discussed. Uh, but one can hope that over time uh, the situation opens up so that uh, the resources can be provided that, as you properly point out, are so necessary. But that, that $20 billion is huge. And it wasn't just to train entrepreneurs, it was for infrastructure. And anybody who's been to Cuba sees okay, this. 25 years ago. Yeah, exactly. So you see this huge deficit in infrastructure. I'm still paying. Uh, wait, where's it going to come from? I mean, it's obviously not going to come from the United States, at least. Well, if you're, in the foreseeable yeah, well, if you're talking about the general uh, overall economic <clears throat> development of the island, uh, it's, it's, it's terribly undercapitalized. Uh, the, the machinery, etc., virtually everything has to be replaced. I mean, they're virtually, in terms of economic development, I mean, they're virtually starting from ground zero. Now, that has the silver lining of that is that you can try to leapfrog technologies and really get the latest and the greatest. Uh, but that, of course, would require a, a major opening uh, that they have not yet been willing to come. Yes, sir. Yes, um, <clears throat> my name is Heino Wigler. I'm director for Global Projects with Hayden Jones, which is an international transportation group. Uh, I'm, I'm from Germany, and the question that the gentleman had was actually also part of my question. Would we have to assume that the development in Cuba would be similar in the future as we have seen with China? China always also is a very communist country, of course, but there's a certain entrepreneurship which has endured over millennia in China. So there are, there are millions of small enterprises. And they always you know, make money even though they're their official position. Um, now with Cuba, of course, it's a much smaller country. It does not have the uh, political power, for example, as China has nowadays. But somehow the China, the Communist uh, Party, has uh, kept a grip on the population. Of course, it has a very um, efficient security system, which is, of course, also in, in place in Train, trained by the East Germans, by yeah. the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm from West Germany, but still. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have security systems in West Germany. Uh, but the question is, uh, you know, we see the development in China. We've seen how China has been able to somehow uh, manage both the capitalist investments but maintain the communist uh, control. Uh, we've seen that it didn't work in Germany. The population protested, and um, but it, but it took a lot of time and a lot of money in order to remedy the situation. We've seen it in, uh, in Russia. It completely failed. There was a vacuum after the Russian uh, um, 
government collapsed because it was a vacuum and certain groups lose their control until we have strong men again at their time um, taking over now with Mr. Putin. And um, some other communist countries are still trying to attach themselves to a certain way to the, to the capitalist societies. So I think that the China way... No, and the question, give me the question. Yeah, the question is basically, would it be fair to assume that Cuba would follow and be set for China? So uh, trying to look into my crystal ball of the future, you know, what, what, might, what might Cuba look like, let's say, in 10 years? It's a, a medium term. When you were consulting with Raul. Yeah. <laughs> and I think broadly one can see three possible scenarios. Uh, one is uh, more or less where they are now, moving very gradually and slowly. Uh, um, another would be that you know, sort of Eastern Europe, that sort of all of a sudden the place becomes a democracy. Uh, and the third, which seems to be the most likely in the medium run, is uh, the Vietnam scenario. And uh, I, I also published a piece on, about this in the Financial Times uh, a month ago, a whole section on Cuba. Uh, and I was in Vietnam um, in February, and sort of based upon that experience. And what do I mean by the Vietnam scenario? Of course, every country is very different, but in general terms. I mean, a hybrid economy in which the state still remains strong, the state still controls most of the banking sector, for example, uh, a lot of the construction firms, a lot of the hotels, uh, the military plays some role in all of that. But there's also a large and growing private sector. A lot of that private sector does come out of the Communist Party, uh, uh, but increasingly is independent of that and has its own uh, economic dynamism. And then a very large scale foreign investment sector. And Vietnam is very integrated into global supply chains. So if you, if any of you are wearing Nike sneakers, chances are pretty good those were manufactured uh, in Vietnam. Um, uh, they have lots of international hotels there. Uh, it's a, the coast of Vietnam, Da Nang, some of you may remember that from the Vietnam War. It's now a major uh, so what's keeping hotel them chain from a, which <coughs> Asian, for Asians mainly. Um, but so, a decision, so in the 1980s, Vietnam started in that direction, uh, but then they did have some back and forth, so it didn't all happen all at, you know, overnight. Uh, but then there was a clear decision made uh, in the mid to late 80s that they really were gonna move ahead in a serious way. Um, and I don't think that decision has been made yet uh, by the, to the extent that one can see, by the Cuban Communist Party. Why not? Uh, well, uh, I think because I mean, what the Sun suggests is uh, logical. I mean, every yeah. every European, North American, Latin American that goes to Cuba thinks, well, obviously they should do that. Yeah. Why haven't they? Okay, well, a number of, uh, and again, I, I really do want to emphasize it's a very opaque regime. Uh, these senior folks are not accessible, uh, so we we just have to try to in, in, uh, intuit uh, what their reasoning uh, might be. Uh, first of all, it's one thing to hold on to power in Asia, which uh, you know, the dominant power in Asia, after all, is China. Uh, and then uh, you have Confucianism and other sort of, let's say, authoritarian uh, factors that support the maintenance of a one-party state. Um, in the middle of the Caribbean, I think the Communist Party of Cuba has to think, mm, can we really hold on here once we open up economically? I'm sure they must be very concerned about that. For, I mean, for better, you know, some regimes are better than others, but every country in the Caribbean basin, uh, including uh, Louisiana, Florida, Alabama, <laughs> at least are nominally democratic, right? Uh, so can you maintain, formally speaking, a one-party state uh, in, in the sea of democracies in the Caribbean, I'm sure it's something that, that concerns them. So hence, when they look at, they know that what they don't want to have happen, which is what happened in Eastern Europe, they know that's definitely what they don't want to have happen. You know, the regime collapses. Uh, so they're thinking, can we do what Vietnam did uh, in the Caribbean? And it'd be fascinating to hear those conversations. Good. Who's about? Oh, thank you for that message. Short uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> quick, uh, quick question in reference to you, you talk about the Caribbean, but how, with potential opening of Cuba, how do you see that 
affecting the rest of the Caribbean because a lot of nations in the Caribbean are so dependent on, on tourism from the United States and yeah. Africa. How's it going to affect the rest of the Caribbean? Uh, creating difficulties. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, people who, I think you have some people going to Cuba who wouldn't go to the other islands. You have people who are just fascinated. They want to see Cuba uh, because it's been forbidden fruit. And Cuba does have thing, uh, you know, Havana has uh, by far the largest uh, Spanish colonial uh, old town uh, in the Caribbean. And so, the, uh, and Cuba has a lot of uh, performing arts, et cetera, that, that is unique. Uh, but, uh, so people will go there who might not go to other resort areas. But if you're, if you're talking about sun and surf, and that sort of tourism, there's no doubt that Cuba will be competitive for other countries in the region. Now, some of the really sort of smarter entrepreneurs uh, on, the, on the islands you know, saw this coming, and they did what a smart entrepreneur would do, which was invest in Cuba. <laughs> and so you, uh, you have some hotel chains who already have uh, invested in Cuba to protect themselves against what's coming. But yeah, I, I think if you are um, you know, in Barbados or Jamaica uh, or, the, or the Dominican Republic, you have to be concerned. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, right here. What is the economic gain that you can expect from this relationship with Cuba? The economic gain. For Cuba or for the United for States? Us, yeah. What are the gains for the United States of this relationship? Uh, uh, there are possibilities that you can imagine of uh, complementarities. So uh, a cruise ship, for example, that stops in Havana, you know, might also stop, uh, you know, in other parts of the Caribbean. Uh, package deals that take you to several islands. So there are possible complementarities. Uh, but also clearly to competitiveness regarding tourism. Uh, so in terms of U.S. economic op opportunities, all right, it's uh, 11 million people, so it's not a huge market, and the average person is poor, uh, you know, middle, middle class at best. Uh, but I, as I said, they're starting from virtually ground zero. So if you are a paint company or a brick company, uh, or you know, Sherwin-Williams, uh, there's, there's 10 million, you know, House or four million households that need paint and they need everything else that goes into a household. Uh, if you electrical appliances, if you do infrastructure, if you build roads, uh, power plants, uh, in, you know, anything to do with IT. So uh, there, there is a market there for that's, that's very in the short term. Where's yeah. where there? Uh, so uh, so and so if you want to, that's if you oriented towards the domestic market. Uh, <clears throat> now, eventually, uh, Cuba will export. One certainly hopes, right? Uh, and so what might be the export products that Cuba might produce going down in the future? Well, tourism, of course, is one and everything related to tourism. Uh, they have uh, an educated population. Uh, I can easily see they have you know, an IT center there, you know, link up to you know, IT functions in the United States or, or anywhere for that matter. They have a biotech pole. Uh, I'm sure U.S. pharmaceuticals and biotech companies you know, can see possibilities for joint ventures and other, other activities. Uh, so there are various sectors that look relatively promising. The Cubans like to say, oh, we're not going to do any of those sweatshops, right? We're not going to get involved in, in those sort of supply chains. Yeah, well, if you're, if you're a middle class bureaucrat in, in Havana, it's nice to talk like that. Yeah, we're so much better. But actually, if you go to, to, out into the countryside, particularly the eastern part of the island, you're in a third world country. Those people are poor by developing country st standards. And I think some of those people would be absolutely thrilled to work in a factory producing shoes, uh, you know, Nike sneakers. So uh, at some point down the road, uh, why not turn Guantanamo into a free trade zone? That's something equivalent. So I, I do think that, you know, that at some point there'll be opportunities to integrate uh, part of the Cuban labor force into global supply chains. Yes, a question right here. You may kill me afterwards. Uh, I wanted to comment on something. The difference between information. As long as it's short. Short, particularly looking for search. So, um. Because I don't, I don't have to kill you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was a short comment. Okay. Thank, thank you for your comment. Um, then um, I'm wondering um, about the position of other countries that had business with you. I mean, European countries, Canada, Qatar, <coughs> you know, and Angola, I think it's a few hotel fair. How do you think they see this opening of relationships and these new Americans coming in? Okay, thank you. Uh, 
But in terms of Cuba's creditworthiness, uh, there were governments that engaged in the 90s, uh, you know, that money, some joint ventures, and by and large, those were unhappy experiences. Cuba basically ended up defaulting against uh, a lot of those lines of credit. So there was a lot of unhappiness. And famous stories about how uh, you know, bankers or creditors would go to Fidel and say, hey, Fidel, like, you know, you owe us 100 million bucks, and like, where are the payments? And Fidel would say, international solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> and they would say, how about contracts? And there's like, no median lines. All right, but that's sort of in the past. Uh, now I think the, uh, there are some successful uh, European, Latin American, Canadian firms. You know, the major uh, nickel company is a Canadian company that exports nickel. You know, the nickel comes out of uh, central Cuba, about a, a billion dollars worth a year. Uh, the Canadian firm actually takes the raw nickel up to Alberta, Canada, where it refines it and sells it to whom? United States, of course. China. Exactly. <laughs> so Cuban nickel ends up in China. Yeah, thanks to the uh, Canadian companies. Uh, you have some Spanish hotels, Melia. I think they're, they're profitable. Uh, you do have uh, Zero Stars, another one, right? Uh, you have um, uh, Nestle, you know, that distributes ice cream and, and, uh, and bottled water, etc. So you do have a couple of cases of successful European firms. Actually, if in the socialist system, if you can get in, then it's a sweet deal, right? Because all the prices and everything are negotiated and they essentially guarantee your profit and you don't have much market competition. So if you can get in, it's really not, it's a comfortable situation to be in. Uh, but looking forward, yeah, I think um, the, the Europeans are, uh, I think, you know, sophisticated enough to recognize that there are still a lot of problems remaining in the Cuban economy. There are opportunities. Uh, there's a British company that's trying to break into the power sector, for example. Uh, the Cubans have said they want to allow in some condo uh, resort mar with marinas and stuff, you know, upper middle class tourism. Uh, some of that will probably happen, uh, and the, the British and the Canadians and, and the Spanish will take the lead. So there are opportunities that, that, that they're looking at, but I think on the whole, uh, with some degree of caution, uh, based upon the realities and their, and their experiences. Okay, we're going to move into the speed round now. Short questions, short answers. We've got 15 minutes left. Are you an undergrad? Okay, okay, you get the question. Um, it seems to me that you, uh, where are you an undergrad? I am an undergrad at the University of Rochester in New York. Excellent. <laughs> um, it seems to me that you emphasize a lot the personal relationships. You talk about Raul's respect for Obama, and you talk about the interactions between American tourists and Cubans. How do you see those relationships? Wonderful. That, that's a wonderful question. It is. Which is difficult to give a short answer. How do you see the personal relationships, which Richard had emphasized, and the relationship between Obama and Raul Castro dovetailing into policy? That's the short question. Here's the short answer. So, uh, can we say all politics is personal? Is that a short enough answer? Yeah. <laughs> okay, one more sentence. Go ahead. And? Well, uh, the official uh, umbrella under which U.S. policy is, is organized, which actually goes back to some legislation that Congress passed in the 1990s, is people-to-people -people diplomacy. Uh, the idea that interaction among peoples uh, is healthy uh, for both parties, by the way. Not, you know, Americans can learn a lot from Cuba as well. Uh, but that also, eventually, you add up all these personal experiences and they then have a political impact. 